There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. You know the famous poem by Robert Frost, Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler, long I stood and looked down as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Two woods diverging, and to the left one traveler may go, and this is the path of lawlessness. Along this road, looking for life, people pursue pleasure. Disregarding what God has said, they press forward to do what they desire to do. It seems right to a man, but it leads in death, leads to death. The second road, as you stand at that divide and peer down it, leads in the opposite direction and winds here and there. And as you go along that road, you meet a man like Pelagius, who came from Britain in the 400s about and visited with people. And as an ascetic, he gave up all that he could. And he said that there was no sin inherited from Adam. And he taught people that they had the ability to do good. And many followed his teaching. As you continue down this road, you'll run into Joseph Smith, who teaches certain temple rituals and rites to achieve the celestial glory. You'll run into Russell, Taze Russell. You'll run into Jehovah's Witnesses, Oneness Pentecostals. You'll run into all kinds of religionists down this path. In fact, you will find people who will tell you what you must do in order to be saved. Follow the eightfold path, says Siddhartha Guatamo. Follow the, the five pillars, says Muhammad. Follow the Ten Commandments, says the Sanhedrin. Down this path is legalism. Down this path is the effort to keep the law. There's two roads that diverge in the forest. And both of them lead to death. There are two roads that lead to death. One comes to this thing, this pillar of stone. And it's called the law. It's the commandments of God. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. And confronted with that in his face, he turns to the left and he says, I will. Has God really said? He disregards the law of God and goes his own way. Not concerned for what God has said. The other path says, I will. You tell me to do this and I will. This path is called legalism, where the person tries genuinely to keep the law of God. To the left, the person breaks the law and is broken by it. To the right, the person tries to keep it but falls short and the end thereof is death. Two roads. And all the people of this earth are travelers in this woods. And all are confronted with this law, having to choose to go left or right. And none of them find life. The gospel of grace is the good news that God came down from heaven and rescued dead sinners. You see, these wanderers in the forest are dead, like zombies, the walking dead. To the left, they look for life in the things of the world. To the right, they look for life in keeping the law, but the problem is they can't keep it and they are dead. The gospel of grace is that God has come down and rescued dead sinners to himself. It's a different path altogether. It's the only path of salvation. It's the way of Jesus Christ. That he, being God, was born into this world from a virgin and lived a perfect sinless life, walking in perfect righteousness according to the law as no other man could. And keeping the law, he accrued righteousness actively in obedience to the law. 
Then dying on the cross, he died the sinner's death in the stead of sinners, and he rose from the grave giving life to those who will believe in him. This is the message of grace. It's revealed from heaven, just like the Son of God came down from heaven. No one would have guessed it. No one would have imagined it. It's the only way to be saved. This is the gospel of grace. Today, turn with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 15. This week we will deal with the danger to the right. The danger of legalism that leads to death. The path that promises life but cannot deliver. And next week we'll talk about antinomianism. Those who are against the law. Acts chapter 15. I notice a lot of people don't preach this passage because it's not too exciting. They'll just skip it. But it's important because many wander down this path to the right. It's interesting, in Robert Frost's poem, he was actually writing that poem as a joke to his friend, Edward Thomas. Edward Thomas and he used to go for a walk in the woods often, and Thomas would always deliberate about which way to go. And sometimes he would go down one way and he would always regret the way that he chose, thinking if he had only gone the other way, things would have worked out better. As he looked back on the path that he would take in the road less traveled, he says he chose the one less traveled. Robert Frost writes that. But then as he thinks about it more in the poem, he says, well, actually, they're about equally traveled. And the leaves have covered the path, and you can't tell which is more traveled. That's how it is in this world. I don't know if there's more people who die to the left or die to the right. There's more than a billion who follow the teachings of Muhammad. And there's maybe close to a billion who follow the teachings of the Buddha. Many people follow religion, and many people that you know go down that path and die by it. And yet it's a more sinister road because people traveling that way think that by their works they are being saved when in fact they're losing the one way of salvation which is by grace alone. So turn with me to Acts 15. Sinners are saved solely through the grace of the Lord Jesus. Any teacher who adds work requirements, that's rituals, good works that you have to do, traditions, sacraments, whatever, as a means of salvation, is departing from the gospel. Many people who claim Christianity will say that grace is necessary, that God sends His grace to save sinners, that's necessary for salvation. But they will not say that grace is sufficient, that grace is able to do saving work. It's up to the sinner to add some work to what Jesus has accomplished. And today we're going to talk about why that is so dangerous, why that teaching is actually a false road that leads to nothing but death. Let's read it in the text. I'm going to read through just 11 verses today but crucial for our understanding of the gospel of grace. Often, when we're trying to understand something, we want to see it in crystal clear focus. One of the best ways to understand something is to look at what is not that thing. This, not that. It brings it into clear focus when you're able to distinguish it from something that looks like it, but it's different. When we say, this is what grace is, we clarify that by saying, now that's what it is not. So that's why this is so important today. In Acts 15, 1 to 11, but some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy 
to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as He did to us. And He made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? Now mark this verse very well. Highlight it, underline it, star it. Memorize it if you can. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. That's the thesis of what I hope to teach today. That we are saved by grace, through faith. In Christ. Without work, without any, adding anything to what God has done, He provides salvation. We contribute nothing. In Acts 15, 1, some teachers, notice they come down from Judea. Now, notice this is due north from Jerusalem. Antioch is north of Jerusalem, but everything when you're coming from Jerusalem is down. Okay, even if you're heading due north, the hill of Jerusalem is kind of the center point of God's economy. And going down from Jerusalem, they go north to, to Antioch. These teachers come and they declare, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Wherever the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached, there will be danger in the churches of those who will come and say that you must add something to what Christ has done in the gospel. What do they add in this verse? Circumcision. In other words, the sign of Judaism, Abraham having circumcised Isaac, was by that sign indicating that he was part of the promise, the covenant people of God, the descendants of Abraham. The children of God. And so these Judaizers come and say, you must become Jewish in order to be saved. You must circumcise your children and raise them to obey the entire law of Moses. And by law keeping, plus the work that Jesus did, you can be saved. Notice these are believers. These are people who believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They just want to add one thing, one thing in this verse. The sign of circumcision. Mark that well. In verse 2, after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. Here's a question. Is debate good or bad? Is debate good or bad? Well, let's look at the text. After Paul and Barnabas, these are apostles, had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem about this question. In this text, debate is good. Debate is good. Now, why do I stress this so much? Because in the culture that we live in, there has been a downgrading of the concept of truth. Many people in our culture believe that truth is privatized. That I have my truth and you have your truth. 
And each person brings their own truth to the table. Therefore, the one sin, the one undebatable thing is to say that your truth is better than somebody else's. That would be intolerant. That would be evil. But the higher your view of truth is, the higher your view of the scripture is, the more you will appreciate the entire field of apologetics. Because in apologetics, we make a defense of the gospel. 1 Peter 3.15, always be ready to give a defense for the hope that you have. It presupposes that you believe that God speaks truth and our part is to be conformed to that. And so there's reason for debate, especially in non-peripheral matters, but things that are essential to the gospel. The more passionately you love Jesus Christ, the more important it will be to you to defend the gospel of grace. I want you to mark in verse 2 that for Paul and Barnabas, this is no small dissension. No small dissension and debate. They are passionate about this subject. This subject matters to them. This subject matters to them so much they are willing to fight for the truth of the gospel of grace. Verse 3, So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles, and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem... They were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. Now notice, what we are defending, our apologia, our defense, is of something positive and joyful and good and worth dying for and worth defending. It is the gospel of grace. As Paul and Barnabas are traveling along, they're spreading the word of the gospel of grace and how the gospel of grace is triumphing wherever they go. Turn with me to Acts chapter 20, verse 24. Another great memory verse if you want to take some time this week to memorize a Bible verse. This would be well worth your time. Acts chapter 20, verse 24. Paul says but I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. The message of God can rightly be summarized in the word grace. It is the gospel of grace. And Paul can rightly say that this gospel is more valuable to him than his very life. I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Returning to Acts 15, notice he's passionate enough to defend it, but in verse 3 and 4, this is what he's talking about wherever he goes. Brothers and sisters, we have something beautiful. We have something amazing. We have something positive to say to the world. The message of God's grace, the message of a God who saves undeserving sinners is the treasure that we carry with us. And people here are brought to great joy, verse 3, as they hear it. The message of grace. Learn to treasure what we're going to talk about today. The message of grace and grace alone. Verse 5. Here then is the contrast. This is the contrast that will bring grace back into focus and help you, help me to see it more clearly, hopefully than ever before. Some believers who belong to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. They've made it up to Jerusalem. 
And there they are encountered by some religious people. Notice believers. These are people who are professing Christ. But I want you to notice something else about them. Do they ask a question of the apostles? Do they ask the elders of that local congregation? Do they ask Paul and Barnabas? No. What does it say? They said. They said. They brought a teaching. They said it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. These are false teachers in the church. And there is danger within the church of Jesus Christ. We know there's danger out there in the world where all kinds of wickedness is practiced. We know there's danger without. But I think the danger within the church is greater than the danger in the world. Because these are people who profess to follow the same God and the same Bible that we follow. And yet they add something to salvation. They add as necessary. Look at that word necessary in verse 5. Going back to, to verse 1, unless you are circumcised, you cannot be saved. It is necessary that someone obey the full law in order to be saved. These are requirements for salvation. Verse 6, the apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. Notice who it is that God has appointed. First of all, apostles, because apostles bring New Testament revelation from God. And what the apostles write and say in leading the church is authoritative for the church. Not just for then, but for all time. And that's how it is that we have the apostolic word, which is the authority over the church. Notice also that there are elders present because elders are the ones who safeguard the doctrine that the apostles taught. The apostles won't live forever. But every local church will be ruled or led, I should say, by elders. And the role of elders, according to Titus 1.9, is to refute those who contradict the gospel of grace. It's to safeguard the apostolic word. So it's the apostles and the elders that are gathered together, together to consider this matter. In verse 7, after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. That was God's choice, the hearing and the believing of the gospel from Peter's mouth would happen. But notice in verse 7 at the beginning it says, after there had been much debate. After much debate. Peter stood. Each of those words indicate that this is an authoritative pronouncement. A lot of people interpret this Jerusalem council to flow something like this. Peter gets up and gives his opinion. Paul and Barnabas give their opinion. And then finally, James, the brother of Jesus, steps up and gives the final and decisive authoritative word on the subject. I don't think that's what's happening here. According to verse 7, Peter, who was the apostle chosen by God and who is the leader among the apostles, as Jesus had ordained that to be, one of the inner circle, Peter stands up, which indicates a position of authority. And he says that God has already established this issue. Recognize, it had been 10 years earlier. We studied it just a few weeks ago. In Acts 10 and 11, we did a three-part series called No Distinction. And in that, God reveals that the Gentiles are included in the gospel of grace by faith. This question was settled when God revealed it through Peter. And the Gentiles at that time were not required to be circumcised. They were not required to keep the law of Moses. It's further confirmed in verse 10 when Peter says, now therefore, why are you putting God to the test? 
Peter is not standing up to throw out an opinion. He is saying God has spoken. And if you disagree with that, you are testing God. He is making an authoritative pronouncement as an apostle. So look at verse 8 and 9. Here is the issue of the gospel, and it brings it into crystal clear focus for me when I read this. And God, who knows the heart, why does Peter say who knows the heart at this particular place in the text, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Uh, I ask, Lord, that you would make your gospel clear through this. God knows the hearts, and he cleanses hearts by faith. That's the instrument he uses. That's the soap he uses to scrub away all sin and defilement. God uses faith in the heart of a person who will believe in Christ. Now notice what happened in Acts 10 and 11 you go back to chapter 11, verse 12. God made no distinction. How so? Well, when faith was born in the hearts of the Gentiles, in that particular instance, God gave an outward visible sign that they were in fact believing. They began to speak in tongues. And that outward sign confirmed to Peter the Apostle that they also were welcomed without the works of the law. It settled the issue there and then. And Peter speaks here in the past tense in verse 8. He bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. Just as we had Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, the Gentiles had their Gentile Pentecost in Acts chapter 10. And by that unique miracle, Peter was able to say, that God welcomes them by faith. In other words, we cannot see what happens in the heart of another person. We cannot see who's genuinely believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. You could be sitting here today, listening to me preach. Maybe you've sat here for months or years, but in your heart, you do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You do not believe that His Word has authority over your life. And I can't see that. I can't see into the heart to know who is genuinely born again. There's others that may struggle with sin and you would say, there's no way this person has genuine faith. They must not be born again. But guess what? I can't see their heart to know that for sure. And by your fruits you will know them. But ultimately, at the final level, it's God who knows the heart. And here's the point of the gospel. This glorifies God because in His grace, He saves those who have faith in Him. He alone knows the heart. God alone knows the heart. Faith comes into the heart as a gift from God. And unless you have that, you're still wandering in that forest. You may be religious. You may be doing good things like coming to church. You might take communion with us. You might have been baptized. Every ritual, the outward things that we do might give you hope that you're genuinely born again. But unless faith has been born in your heart, you're not yet saved. This is the distinction. The outward versus the inward. The Jewish people wanted an outward sign. Unless you are circumcised, you cannot be saved. They wanted the outward rituals of keeping the law, the ceremonial, ceremonial and the dietary laws, that if you could keep these things, we'll recognize that you're genuinely saved. But the text points out God knows the heart and faith resides in the heart or it doesn't. So in verse 10, Peter says you put God to the test if you try to add these outward things as necessary for salvation. And finally in verse 11, but we believe 
that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. I want to quickly make six statements, three assertions and three negations from the Word of God. Three positive things and three negative things about the grace of God. And then we'll tie it up in a conclusion as to what we're to take and do with this gospel of grace. Assertion number one, and by the way, the, the first five comes from Romans. So we're going to flip to five quick verses in Romans. If you're quick with your Bible, you can keep up. If not, it's already in your notes. Take them home, look at them. The first assertion about grace comes from Romans 3, verse 24. We are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Justification is to be declared righteous. To be declared righteous. The Bible says that people who are guilty and dead in sin will be declared righteous by God by grace. Verse 24. Now we'll learn about faith in just a minute. And we are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now I want to make a point about this legal declar declaration of not guilty. One of the theologians I like is named John Murray. And he helps to distinguish what we're talking about here by comparing the difference between a judge and a surgeon. A judge sits on the throne and does nothing inwardly to change the person who's under investigation, who's on trial. A surgeon, on the other hand, goes into the patient, perhaps to remove some diseased part of that person, a cancerous tumor, let's say. Justification is the work of a judge, not a, not a surgeon. Justification is when God legally declares that you are righteous. That's important. John Murray says, The purity of the gospel is bound up with the recognition of this distinction. If justification is confused with regeneration or sanctification, then the door is open for the perversion of the gospel at its center. Justification is still the article of the standing or the falling of the church. He says that regeneration is different. Regeneration is when God, like a surgeon, renews you from the inside and it changes how you live. And then you're sanctified. You go along this path in life becoming more and more like Christ. You're changed over time. But justification is God's legal declaration that you are innocent. You are not guilty. You say, wait a minute, I'm not innocent. I'm a lawbreaker. Well, here's the good news of the gospel. You miss this, you lose the gospel. God legally declares righteous over you because he takes the righteousness of Christ and he imputes that. He credits that to you. And in that moment, you are declared righteous once and for all. The judge has acquitted you and you no longer are condemned. Romans 8, 1. Now those who are in him, there is no condemnation. No more condemnation. A judge either condemns or justifies. We are legally declared righteous by faith. And according to Romans 3.24, this is a gift of grace. And so that leads me to the second assertion. The second assertion. You see, if it is by grace, then it accords with faith. Faith in the heart accords with the grace that comes from God. Turn with me to Romans 4.16. As he's giving this discourse on justification by faith, he connects the two. And this is the assertion that it's so important 
that each of us understand. Romans 4.16, that is why it depends on faith. In order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. The way that God saves sinners is by grace through faith. And those two ideas of grace and faith are not completely separate ideas. It's the grace of God that brings faith into the heart by which we are legally declared righteous. It is by faith in order that it might rest on grace, according to Romans 4.16. And later in chapter 10, he'll say, look, who can accomplish his own salvation? Shall I ascend up into heaven to bring him down? Or should I descend into to the grave to bring Christ up from the dead? No. The word is near you. It is in your heart. So that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is, is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Do you see? This goes back to what Peter is saying in Acts 15. God who knows the heart. God who knows the heart gives faith